All right, Garant, so we're here, we're on the island of Hvar in Croatia, and here's a little piece of the island behind us. Uh, so we're at the John Bell Institute for the Foundations of Physics, talking about entropy, but this week on uh, Alas, Lewis and Barnes, we want to talk about something that actually you've done some, some work on, and it uh, com com comes up constantly, mm -hmm. well, reasonably constantly. Uh, we want to talk about uh, the weird things that can happen to get you from place to place in the universe. We want to talk about uh, wormholes and about warp drives. Yes. So how do we make them and can we really make them? Okay, so let's start off at, with the, at the beginning here, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of people um, have heard of Einstein's special theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that comes out of the special theory of relativity is you can't outrun a light beam, mm -hmm. okay? So you send off some light into the universe and any spaceship you ever build, biggest rocket, etc., you cannot keep up with that light beam. It will always get ahead of you. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have all of these effects in special relativity that uh, people... You know, it, there's so much written about time dilation. So yeah. if you travel at high speed in the universe and come back, people on Earth will have er, um, aged much, much more than the people on the rocket ship, etc. Mm -hmm. But it does seem to put a dampener on exploring the universe, <laughs> yeah. right? It, it might be to the person on the rocket ship that it might only take them a year to get to the nearest star. Um, but uh, for people on Earth, four years have passed, etc. So if we did travel through the universe obeying only the laws of special theory of relativity. Everybody would have different clocks and ages, and it would, for the people on Earth, yeah. the center of the empire, <laughs> it would still take forever for yeah. us to get out there because the uh, Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years from side to side, yep. as told by Monty Python. <laughs> right? uh, so that's how long it will take a ship to cover those kind of distances. But that ruins science fiction stories. <laughs> Absolutely ruins, and, right? And it, that can't happen. Well, surely, yeah. I mean, it, has, it does appear in some science fiction. So the movie Passengers, which has a spaceship traveling to another oh, star. Yeah. Everyone's in suspended animation because the journey is going to take so long, etc. So, But in reality, in a lot of uh, science fiction, you want to get from one star to the other and you want to do it in no time at all, <laughs> yeah. right? You want to get there and get on with the fighting the bad guys. Or you don't want that scene where the kids are going, are we there yet in the back? Exactly. So the question is, is that, yes, we are, uh, we are bounded by the rules of special relativity, but are there ways to get round the rules? Not break the rules, just bend the rules, right? <laughs> by using the more complete theory, right? The general theory of relativity, which of course, includes special relativity, mm -hmm. it's a special case. But then on top of that, instead of having this flat space time, which is the background in special relativity, you can now start to bend and stretch and warp space time. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you get around? So the, the answer is, is that you can play around with the mathematics of space time, okay? Right. So when we describe space time, and this will drive the mathematicians nuts because they, they know that uh, physicists are very uh, sloppy with their words. Fast and loose. Yeah. Fast and loose. Uh, we, we talk about the metric, right? That, yeah. that, that so it basically tells you how your space time is, is laid out. And you can write down the mathematics, mm -hmm. right? And you can play what's known effectively as metric mechanics, okay? okay. It's because it, it works in that way that imagine, imagine that I can imagine a space time. <laughs> yeah. So I could write down the mathematics of that space time and then I can ask myself, what's the consequences of that space right. time, right? And the metric's really the way of saying, all right, if I want to go from one event to another event, how, how can that happen? How do I navigate through my space time? It's, I mean, it's a line element is the, the technical term, right? Yes. A, a little bit of a path through space and time. Yes, yes. So I, I noticed you threw a few bits of space-time jargon yeah, yeah. in there as well. Events, yes, a party in a particular place at a particular yeah. time is an event. And what we're talking about, um, of course, are journeys through space-time. Yeah. And our journey through space-time will depend upon what that space-time is doing. Sure. So one of the... Um, what we have to remember, we can go all the way back to 1916, right? So Einstein's great success my uh, general theory, here's all the mathematics, and he just looks at the maths and just goes, bloody hell, this stuff's hard. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> Thus setting a trend for the next hundred years. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was um, um, 
Carl Schwarzschild, who was uh, serving, I think, on the Eastern Front in World War One. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, and he he was a mathematician, and he was he was playing with these equations, and he found the equation for um, uh, what we now know as the Schwarzschild solution, which includes the pretty standard black hole kind mm -hmm. of picture where matter completely collapses. Uh, I won't go into the details, but you know, there's different ways of representing that space time, mm -hmm. and um, it, by the early 1940s, people were starting to realize that you could connect bits of space-time. There's a famous thing called the Einstein-Rosen bridge, mm -hmm. which is related to the Schwarzschild solution. But if you, if, you, if you sort of unfold the Schwarzschild solution, you see that it's richer than just the mathematics as written down by Schwarzschild. Okay. And it actually has, inside that one set of maths, the black hole, the universe in which we exist, but it also gives you a white hole, which is the opposite of a black hole, stuff gets spewed out of it, and another universe. Right. And it was realized that there was a bridge between our universe and this other universe. Mathematical universes, of course, right? Called the Einstein-Rosen bridge. Mm -hmm. That you can, you can, in some sort of very hand-wavy kind of way, get from one universe to the other by this connection. Okay. Okay. It, it's a really messy piece uh, to try and understand. Um, but people sort of realized that um, well, maybe you can build shortcuts. If you've got space-time and you're talking about your journey through space-time and that's what, I don't know, limits uh, how far you can get in what sort of time, then if you imagine your space-time is sort of bent and etc., maybe you could build a tunnel between two points in space-time. Right. Okay? And so this is where the notion of the wormhole came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wormhole really came to... Um, came to the public consciousness mm -hmm. with the book Contact by yep. Carl Sagan. And he spoke uh, with Kip Thorne, who is now a Nobel Prize winner for his work on gravitational waves, yep. and basically said, oh, look, I'm, I'm writing this science fiction story. I'm a scientist. I want to make it hard sci-fi, i.e. You know, <laughs> at least somewhat embedded in the mathematics. How do I do it? Right. I, I don't want to wait for my heroine to fly all across the universe. <laughs> uh, and uh, Kip Thorne came up with this, the mathematics, mathematical picture of the wormhole. Yeah. And essentially, it's exactly as the name suggests. Actually, it's just like this island of Havar behind us, <laughs> right? Right. Uh, this island is very steep. It's very rocky. Yeah. Uh, and to cross this island, you'd have to go all the way up the top, yeah, yeah. all the way down the other side. It takes for ages. And what uh, uh, the military, military did here, which people do in a lot of countries, is you build a tunnel through the mountain, yeah. right? You build a shorter route between two points, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a very narrow tunnel. It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> it cool. Is, especially at night. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so effectively, you can write down the mathematics of a tunnel between two places. And in fact, the solution as given to us by Thorn yeah. is a tunnel between two separate universes. Okay. And so you could be in one universe, trundling along, and you could flip through and end up in another universe. Okay. Okay? So it connects to... So if the tunnel wasn't there, they would be completely unconnected. You can't get there from here yes. kind of situation. Okay. You put the tunnel in, it gets you into other universes. Okay. Okay? Um, but people had said, well, well, of course, you know, that, that's the mathematics that, that Thorne has given us. But what if we could have a worm or hole in our universe, right? right? Connected to another part of the wormhole, also in our universe. Right. And you, so you could have a wormhole here on Earth and a wormhole at the next star. Mm -hmm. right? And um, you could make that distance from uh, the distance of the tunnel, you could make it as short as you wanted, whereas the distance outside the tunnel it's yeah. like four light years. Yeah. So you could step through and come out on the other side and you'd be at the other star. This is very sci-fi, isn't it? It right? is very sci-fi. And actually, there is an even better science fiction aspect to it, which I, I, I thought about a long time ago, but I discovered in, uh, it was written up in a book, um, and I'm, so I'm struggling now, I think it might be called The, the Light of Other Worlds. We'll put a link down below. I think it might have been Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke. Or not, one, I'll, I'll blank it out and we'll put the right name. Yeah, yeah. Here. Anyway, the, what this also pointed out is that if you can create wormholes and you put the exit in a different place, yeah. you could also put the exit in a different time. Yeah. And you could step through and you could find yourself 
in a different place and a different time. Right. Okay. So, wormholes, pretty cool. Okay. Now, we'll come back to the problem with wormholes when we mention the next solution. Right. Okay. Now, you remember this solution? You were in my GR class. What's it uh, called? Yeah, I uh, know. I've totally forgotten what it's called. You, you literally told it to me like two minutes ago, <laughs> and I've still forgotten what it's called. No, it's gone. Alcubia. Alcu Alc yeah, Alcubia. Yeah. Alcubia, is that it? Yes. Oh, that's, that's right. right. The Alcubia. It was. It was. That'll look great in the edit. <laughs> yeah. The Alcubia warp drive. Okay. Okay. So, so um, it's kind of funny again. Uh, the the words warp drive. That's the words of science fiction. Yeah. Okay. Clearly science fiction. Warp drive. Star Trek. Warp factor ten. Mm -hmm. Off you go into the universe. And so, yeah, science fiction's over there until Alcubia uh, working, I think in the 1990s, mm -hmm. um, was also playing metric mechanics mm -hmm. and just thought, right, well, if I take a flat bit of space time, uh, like a special relativity, special relativity yeah, a of... but I put a warp in there, okay. put a bubble in there, right. and a particular kind of warp, metric mechanics, as I said, what you do is you write down the equations, you put that warp in, and ask what the question, ask the question, what happens to that bubble? Now, you might say, well, uh, it just sits where it is, and it could do that. Um, but if you sort of tilt the bubble, and I mean tilt in space-time, yeah. right? So there's a gradient in the bubble. You basically have built a little piece of downhill. <laughs> Metric downhill. Metric downhill. And you can start to slide downhill. Right. But as you slide downhill, the bubble moves. So you slide downhill, the bubble moves, and you're still sliding downhill and the bubble moves. And you right. Start. So you, you can start to move in this bubble. Right. Now, the, the really cool thing is that that bubble can move at any velocity. Any, right. any, any velocity. Because you, you're messing around with space-time. You can do that with space-time. Yeah. Right? So the bubble itself whooshes off inside the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, you might say, hang on. You, you told me it was a special relativistic space-time. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you're telling me that you can move faster than light. Mm -hmm. And the answer is I am. But you have to be very careful in what you mean traveling faster than the speed of light. Mm -hmm. When I say I can't travel faster than the speed of light, it's a local statement. Right. Me and a light, light, me and a light ray mm -hmm. line up on a race, go. Light ray will always yeah. go off and beat me. Okay. Me and a light ray somewhere else in the universe, mm -hmm. that comparison is not something that's easy to do in relativity. And we've already mentioned, um, if we haven't, we will mention in the future, um, that you can get superluminal expansion. Things can look like they're traveling faster than yeah. light relative to you. So this, this can happen. But the local speed of light aspect always holds. Right. So if you're inside the warp bubble and you set yourself up in that race mm -hmm. and you say, say go, the light ray will still get away from you, right? But from a person who sees the bubble go by from outside, they see that light ray traveling at faster than the speed of light with respect to them. Right. Because it travels with the bubble also. Okay. So it's, it's a bit like this. If I'm in the bubble and I shine a light, that light's gone as per usual. Um, but, and, and, but what I can do is, and so I guess special relativity says, if you shine a light that way and then you follow its path, you never catch up with it. Yeah. Unless, you know, something weird happens. Uh, but if I shine a light outside the bubble and then jump in and then head off, I can, I can then see myself shining a light at my own face, right? Yes. Because the, the image will come, but the, the light goes this way and I sort of catch up around the outside and then I can have a look at myself. Yes. You can do that, but I have to tell you a very interesting part. I did some work with a, a student of mine, uh, Brendan McMonagall. Mm -hmm. uh, we asked about this question is that if you're in a bubble traveling faster than the speed of light and there are light rays in the universe, mm -hmm. you're going to run into them, right? There's a light ray in front of me, delete. my war bubble comes along. Yeah. Right? What happens to that light ray? And what happens is, is it, it gets caught effectively in the wake of the bubble. Right. Okay. <laughs> so it picks up speed as do all of the photons that, it, that we run into. So we collect them all. And we can trundle off through the universe, flying, collecting light. So we're collecting starlight, cosmic microwave background, all that. It all builds up and we build up this wake at the front of the ship. And then our destination is ahead. We, we see, 
very hard to see it from inside the bubble, right? <laughs> but we know that we should be approaching this brand new planet that we found, Alpha Centauri, definite signs of life there. So we decelerate the bubble. So what that means is you flatten the space time again. Mm -hmm. So the bubble goes flat and all of those photons at the start have been released. Mm -hmm. Now, whilst they've been in the bubble, they've been gaining energy, right? right? So they might have come in as microwave background photons and now they go out as gamma ray photons. <laughs> so our lovely new planet, what's the name of the planet in uh, Avatar? Oh, oh, Avatar. Uh, no, forgotten. Forgotten. Whatever it is, I didn't like the movie anyway. Oh, yeah, it's uh, Tatooine. Yeah, sure. it's Tatooine. It's not Avatar, yeah. of course. You, yeah. you slow down, you shoot out a burst of uh, gamma rays, irradiate everything <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> so you get everywhere you go. So if this, if this was Star Trek, you set out to seek out new life, and as you get to the planet to investigate, you kill it off. Right. It's great. You have to make sure you're facing this way when you break. Yes. Yeah, well, of course, you can do that. But, you know, <laughs> pe it, it, people have suggested that uh, gamma ray bursts, these bursts of gamma rays seen in the sky, there was a suggestion that it's alien spaceships accelerating. Oh, right. Right? Okay. But there's a problem. We are beamed. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. There we there's, a, there's a problem with, um, uh, with wormholes and warp drives and lots of other things. And that problem is that we got to those solutions by playing metric mechanics. Yeah. We played with the warping of space-time. And the question is, is, can we ever warp space-time to get that kind of structure? Right. So then you need the other equations in, in relativity, and this is Einstein's field equations. Mm -hmm. And they relate space-time curvature to distribution of matter and energy. Yep. Okay, so you, you can put in your space-time curvature and it can tell you what kind of distribution of matter and energy you need. And what you find is that both for the wormhole mm -hmm. and to build the warp drive, mm -hmm. you need not just normal matter, like this table, or a gas, etc. Mm -hmm. You need something called negative energy. Uh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's not much of that around. Not well, actually, no, there is. Well, so far as. So, there's a huge amount of it around. Oh, good. You no, know, because the cosmological constant. Why are we telling these people? We could. Okay, oh, I see. Uh, okay. because, the, because the question is we, we, we have no way of um, taking that energy in the cosmological constant, this negative energy, melting it down yeah. and turning it into a material because to get a warp drive or a wormhole you need to have this energy density distributed in a certain kind of way with yeah. a certain density okay so That's a shame. like time travel yeah like time travel whilst it is mathematically possible within einstein's general theory of relativity mm -hmm. we don't know if it's practically possible to ever get the right energy distributions to, to make these exotic space-time structures. Right. But that doesn't mean that we should stop looking, mm. right? Maybe one day somebody will play with one of these solutions, you'll find that what comes out is not necessarily something as, as exotic as standard negative energy, mm -hmm. and we might be able to have our empire through the galaxy. Wonderful. Okay, so movies like Interstellar, where there's the, the warp drive off to the other universe, what you're saying is, okay, we know how to build a space-time that can do that. What we don't know is what to put in the space-time to make it do that. We, we, we can't just grab space-time and start moving it around. That's right. You have to put something there because matter and energy warp space-time. And we don't have, at the moment, we don't have the stuff to make the, the, the wormholes. And That's precisely right. And I should finish by correcting you and saying it wasn't interstellar, you mean contact. Oh, no, I meant, no, there's one in interstellar as well. But, is mm. it a warp drive? Oh, no, there's no warp drive. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to settle this <laughs> over the next four or five hours, as, as well as the other things that we forgot in this episode, yeah. and uh, that'll be enough for now.